let's let's just wait one more minute then we will start Let's 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 start. Welcome everyone to attend uh, today's seminars and uh, just uh, uh, just let you know we don't have a seminar last week but we will have a, we will continue uh, uh, our seminar next week. Uh, so uh, the next week will still be the the, the Zoom uh, meeting. So okay so. Uh, Again, like for today, uh, and we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Harrison to uh, uh, present uh, her careers. Uh, so uh, I hope again, like 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 usual, like you can keep your questions at the end. We will have a, a, a Q and A sessions. Uh, I will still uh, encourage you to turn on the, the camera to ask a question directly. Uh, but you always have the uh, options to uh, to chat to type the question in the chat. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Harris is uh, uh, executive uh, director of the Institute for Food and Development Policy, and also known as Food First. And uh, she learned uh, biology and uh, nutrition science, and her she uh, earned uh, her doctor of PH, uh, doctor PH. Uh, with uh, uh, the emphasis in the public health nutrition and epidemiology at uh, the school public house uh, at uh, Houston and University of Texas. And she uh, uh, taught uh, the community, community nutrition at the Drexel uh, University. And just, uh, Alan, let you know, we have a speaker the week before, it's also from Drexel <laughs> University. <laughs> so that's funny. Uh, uh, since then, she uh, uh, became a congressional fellow with the Select Committee on Hunger, the U.S. House of Representatives through the Congression, uh, Congressional Black Caucus. And uh, since then, she spent uh, uh, 33 years uh, in the USDA and uh, focusing on food and nutrition surveys and human nutrition information surveys and also agriculture research surveys. And she uh, had a lot of experience overseas. And for example, she uh, served as a senior nutrition advisor uh, for programs in Uganda and in uh, Nepal. Uh, and uh, she is also, uh, you know, like uh, her, her, you know, of work life is also fun and she likes the yoga and uh, she also grow uh, i say that i just learned that she grow uh, you know her food uh, through the, the the yoga farm and the wellness center so without the further delay i will uh, pass the floor to uh, dr harris go ahead thank you thank you very much uh and good morning and hello everyone uh, i want to thank you science and policy for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, I must admit that at first I questioned why I was invited to speak uh, because um, I, I just, you know, it, it, it was a surprise uh, to say the least, but, um, you know, I don't really view myself as necessarily a prominent or an expert in the field of nutrition, but I got over that feeling quickly. And so I'm here to speak with you and hope that I can, I don't know, share some pearls of wisdom or what have you um, about my life and, and career. Um, but uh, this year, I'm entering what I'd like to say my 70th rotation around the sun. 
And I've decided uh, to impart as much emotional intelligence as possible, but speak truth to power. Uh, and I feel that way because there's so much craziness going on in this world to not do so. Uh, as Martin Luther King once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And Albert Einstein once said, if I were to remain silent, I'd be guilty of complicity. I share both those quotes because of the traumatic aftermath of mass shootings and yet another murder of a black man by police in this country. This time it was in Memphis, Tennessee, which is about a three hour drive for where, from where I'm located in Greenville, Mississippi. And it's, it's all just very numbing to say the least, but uh, you know, you just keep on, you keep it moving. So today's talk is going to be about me sharing my truth with you. I don't have multiple awards or hundreds of publications or any major acknowledgements that folks in our field use to mark status and credibility. But what I do have are lived experiences in the real world where an African-American woman from Third Ward, Houston, Texas, who marches to her own drum can have an amazing career in food, nutrition, and agriculture and come full circle. And I say full circle because uh, when I first graduated from the University of Texas School of Public Health, I, um, I had the notion that I wanted to uh, work with a nonprofit, but that didn't come to pass. And then also I'm in Mississippi and some years ago, I had a conversation with my grandmother to try to, uh, you know, glean from her as much as she remembered about uh, past uh, relatives and, and ancestors. And she actually told me that uh, it was either her great grandmother uh, or, or uh, great great grandmother, but one of those women was a slave in Mississippi. So I actually, in, in thinking about that and seeing that I'm now in Mississippi where you know friends and family have said, oh my God, how could you go to Mississippi? Uh, I really feel like I've come full circle from uh, my uh, growing up in Houston, Texas, and then now ending here um, in Greenville, Mississippi. In another part of my life, I'm a certified yoga teacher. And one of my mantras is breathe. And uh, that became very important to have that on a Zoom call during um, Zoom meetings uh, when I was in government during the pandemic. But um, I entered the yoga space um, early on when I was in college, but did it off and on. But I became more active in it after surviving a diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. And that led me to uh, back to yoga and really, you know, using it to uh, to ground myself because, you know, after you get a, a, a cancer diagnosis, you get a brand new perspective on what's really important in life. And so my yoga practice has helped me to balance my professional and personal life uh, where we all have challenges to meet. So Imparting some of that with you, uh, I always start my yoga classes by saying, get comfortable in your seat and take a few soothing, deep breaths while I share a short reading. And today, I want to start my talk off that way. I say the same to you, get comfortable. 
breathe deeply and smoothly. Um, know some of you have probably come out of class or so just kind of relax while I read a piece by Pixie Lighthorse on honoring vision. Help us prioritize our health, the health of others and the mama planet. Help us organize and assemble and share our ideas with one another. Help us find ways to clear the obstacles that congest the pathways you're trying to reach us through. Show us how to apply our caring nature to the world so it's a better place for people, a place where we love to live. Help us do our part to create the world here and now. Help us envision it without idealism and pretense. Give us the strength and tenacity to endure, show up at the town hall meetings and do the inner housekeeping that allows us to make a difference for someone struggling the way we once did. Let us move into the next phase with confidence. Ground us, lift us up, ready us for what's to come by putting our feet on the good path. Help us to see with long vision before we set out. Remember the great, great grandchildren who are coming. Keep their air and water clean and spare them our shadows by doing our healing work now and walking our good walk. Those kernels of wisdom are a great segue, I believe, to now sharing my journey in food, nutrition, and agricultural research with you today. I said I am a native Houstonian who spent my formative years in the CUNY Homes housing project across the street from Texas Southern University, a historically Black college and university. Houston Public Schools integrated when I was in the fifth grade. I had a much older sister active in the civil rights movement at the time. And as a result, I was one of 10 children to integrate my junior high school. I was a tough old soul and had to be in a not so welcoming environment. On the other hand, a lot of my living during that time was very much framed by food. My mother was a cook and a maid for some of the wealthiest white families in Houston. Outwardly and statistically, we were poor or low income. However, our inner self-determination and spirit reflected independence, critical thinking, and a very eclectic food palate. My mother was very independent and would quit a job in a minute if things didn't go her way. In fact, you know, we probably, my brother and I probably were, you know, called uh, latchkey kids, but my mother used to say, don't think you can do just anything because I could be home at any time. And she very much was <laughs> true to her word. Um, she once told an employer, you can count that fried chicken all you want. I'm taking some home to my children because I'm here cooking for you and can't be cooking home for them. And that employer, by the way, was one of the wealthiest people in, in Houston, but had the unmitigated gall to actually count uh, pieces of chicken that my mother cooked. Uh, my mother, um, because of the way she was, uh, she instilled a lot of um, independence in me. And because of what she prepared in terms of food at her jobs, we grew up with a very eclectic palate. And there were times when my brother and I would talk about what we had for dinner and the kids on our block would look at us kind of cross-eyed because you know, we'd be talking about steamed artichokes with hollandaise sauce or lamb and mint jelly. And I, by the way, I hated mint jelly. 
uh, smoked oysters to this day I love and things like sauerkraut and sausage, even though I told my mother never to cook sauerkraut ever again. That's just not one of my things. Uh, my mother also carried over ideas on presentation of food because of her job. So before the food guy pyramid or my plate, I grew up knowing that color on your plate was important for eating healthy and being well. Color was a reflection of all the food groups. Coupled with those so-called fancy foods that I grew up eating, add an appreciation for all kinds of food and the influence of Louisiana cooking to our eating habits because both my parents came from Louisiana and both were excellent cooks. Spicy, lots of flavor, no fear of heat reigned in my family. Regardless of socioeconomic and political circumstances, I grew up believing that I had the right to choose my life's path. And when it came to food, I had the right and ability to choose a wide range of foods to consume, regardless of cost, recipe, income, or demographic. I left Houston to attend Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio because I needed a worldview outside of Texas. The high school I went to, the only colleges that the counselors talked about were schools in Texas. And I knew I did not wanna to go to school, college that is in Texas. So Antioch was a wild and crazy place, but there I sharpened my critical and independent thinking skills. I also met my future husband there, a very radical Philadelphian, tall and handsome. When I graduated with a BS in biology, I went back to Texas for graduate school. With scholarships, I graduated from Antioch not owing any money, and I had the same objective for graduate school. So with low tuition, and ultimately a public health fellowship, I achieved that goal. I also lucked up with my first job fresh out of college, working as a technician at the University of Texas uh, Medical School. The PhD I worked for was instrumental in helping me graduate with, with my master's in nutrition science and my doctorate in public health. But oh my goodness, he was a piece of work, very smart, but a chauvinist. He married his high school sweetheart who didn't have a uh, higher education. And to hear him think, you know, he made all the decisions, did everything. But after meeting her and realizing if he hadn't married her, he would have been in loads of trouble because her street smarts and common sense got them through a, a whole lot. The man was very interesting, uh, but I too was, was the same. And early on, you know, uh, we were in this lab on this hallway and other technicians would say, my goodness, how can you talk to your, uh, your, your, your doctor like that. And I was like, what, please. But anyway, he would say things to me like, you aren't like any other black people I know. And my response would be, how many black people do you know having come from one of those states almost in Canada and a town with a cheese name? So that's, you know, that was how we sort of went back and forth. But to this day, we are very close. He allowed me to work full time while going to school full time, where we had an arrangement. Work time hours missed while I was in class could be made up doing experiments over the weekend. Once I entered my doctoral program, I stopped working for him. But when my husband and I bought our first house, I went to him and asked if he had any grant money where he could afford to hire me part-time for a while, and he did. 
what I learned from that experience was to always be mindful of who you are, be respectful, but expect it in return. Establish and value reciprocal relationships. Towards the end of my doctoral program, I worked as a public health nutritionist at the largest public hospital in Houston as a WIC nutritionist. That experience and others in other parts of the world where people don't always have the luxury of choosing what they eat gave me a deeply held appreciation and profound respect for people and their circumstances. These principles and beliefs have framed my trajectory as a professor teaching community nutrition at Drexel University, serving as a congressional fellow with the U.S. House of Representatives Select Committee on Hunger, holding a Fulbright Scholar Fellowship while teaching at the University of Zimbabwe, and working for over 32 years in nutrition evalu program evaluation, nutrition monitoring research, and agricultural research at USDA. At Drexel, I was the first Black professor in the food and nutrition sciences department. I created their community nutrition program and taught first-generation college students to live their learning. My experience at that Houston public hospital taught me that I could never just teach from a textbook. I had my students do projects out in the community at local public schools and at nonprofits that serve various segments of the Philadelphia community. That had never been done in my department. In fact, at that time, back in the day, Drexel was kind of like an island in and of itself. And like a lot of large universities in urban settings, it was located in an area called the bottom in Philadelphia. And, the, it, and it was almost like Drexel was this island, University of Pennsylvania was another island, and then the rest of the community was off to itself. So having my students go out in the community was very new and different for the department. In the past, a cultural foods course, for example, had involved cooking various ethnic foods. For my course, we did not cook. And instead, one of the things we did was go to the UN and meet with staff that talked about worldwide food programs. I wanted my students to see that they could do a multitude of things with their RD and nutrition degrees. And amazingly, because a lot of my students were uh, first generation, when we took that UN trip, I actually had parents calling me wanting to go on the trip too. <laughs> So that was um, that was an experience, but they came along and and it was a good it was a good trip. At the select committee on hunger, I learned how to prepare for a hearing. And let me back up. Uh, my my family always said, "God, you're always moving. You're always doing things." And I would say to them, uh, in fact, they said I was like a tumbleweed. <laughs> But I would say to them that uh, all my moves had a purpose. And it really was to try to learn and experience as much as, as I could. So I was teaching at Drexel, but I heard about this, uh, this congressional fellowship opportunity through the Black Caucus. And I applied and, and got it. So uh, the select committee, on hunger at the time was chaired by Mickey Leland, who was a congressman from uh, my hometown, Houston. So I also felt that that was a real privilege and honor uh, to, to work under him. Uh, sadly, um, at the end of my first year, 
with the select committee, he and some of the younger staff uh, who had flown to uh, Africa with him on a mission were killed in a, a plane crash. So that was a very uh, traumatic experience, uh, not only for me, but uh, for the other staff that had stayed uh, in DC and, and the families of, of all those folks. But during that experience, I learned a lot. I learned about how to, to prepare for a hearing. Uh, I uh, had lots of experiences with various nonprofits in the DC metro area. And I learned also about what I call the missionary complex, where, uh, where, that, where some nonprofits uh, use the people that they are supposed to be serving almost like a commodity. And many of those folks viewed USDA as the devil but beat down the door to become political appointees when a favorable administration came about. The irony of that was just very striking <laughs> and uh, quite interesting to me. The staff that I worked with at the select committee started telling me that uh, I should talk to people at USDA because they needed folks like me to work there. So they arranged a meeting for me with uh, some folks, and that's how I, I got to USDA. Never in my wildest dreams had I even thought about working for the government. And, and in fact, quite naively, I said to myself, oh, I'll do this for a couple of years and, and, you know, and then go do something else. And then, you know, almost like the blink of an eye, I'm there over 32 years, which I still... Um, I'm amazed by. But at USDA, I learned so, so many lessons. I started out at the Food and Nutrition Service. I was in the Office of Analysis and Evaluation where some years earlier, they said ketchup was a vegetable. The biggest part of the USDA budget runs through FNS and the nutrition programs. I learned the value of these programs to their participants, but just as much benefit, if not more, and, and not if, more, goes to agribusiness and the private sector. FNS is where I truly began to learn lessons about the politics of food. My exposure to nutrition monitoring was an eye opener because when I joined the Human Nutrition Information Service, there had just been a very low response rate in the National Food Survey and a scathing GAO report. The staff basically had been thrown under the bus and the census had been called in to correct and redirect operations. They knew nothing about food. Now, mind you, I was in awe of the HNIS staff because many of them were the standard bearers in the nutrition monitoring research literature. And I couldn't believe that here I was uh, serving as the nutrition monitoring director over these folks. But as the director, I sat with the staff in these census meetings where they pontificated about how to do surveys. After a while, I politely told the census folks we wouldn't hold these meetings anymore. I then met with the staff and told them they were the experts and that I had every confidence in their abilities to make things right. They came through. That experience taught me to follow my truth, make difficult decisions when necessary, 
lead with conviction, trust and respect the people you work with and they will follow through. During the Clinton administration's reinventing government phase, our half of HNIS, the Nutrition Monitoring Division, got merged into the Agricultural Research Service. And the Nutrition Education Division became CNPP, the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. Ironically, nutrition monitoring the surveys and the National Nutrient Database had been in ARS and taken out in the 1980s, which just shows you how this, the pendulum can swing back and forth. I had some very interesting experiences in ARS because to be honest, I probably would have never applied for a job in ARS because it was mostly agricultural research. And the human nutrition piece is to them a very small piece, but to the field of nutrition, it's like the, the major <laughs> signature piece that is the foundation for so much research and policy in the field. But we were merged into the agency and we became part of the Bellsville Human Nutrition Research Center. I came into the agency where there were no black women in leadership roles on the research side. I literally had to say a few curse words to the administrator who at the time was also the acting assistant secretary for our mission area and fight to maintain a leadership position in the center. But you know how you think you've won the war, but really you barely won the battle? I was in a leadership position, but not given any responsibility. But those folks didn't realize that this was a country girl from Houston, Texas. And um, I just said, okay, I, I see how things are gonna go. I even had a prominent director in the agency tell me once that I thought too much of myself. So what did I do? I created opportunities and work for myself. I created the USDA Food and Nutrition Summer Institute, where I partnered with colleagues at NIH, FDA, USAID, FNS, and CDC, and worked with 1890s historically Black universities that had nutrition departments. We held summer institutes for a number of years, held two in Africa, one in Ghana and one uh, <clears throat> in South Africa. And I like to think that we taught students to live their learning. Students that participated in our summer institutes became not only RDs, but earned masters and doctorates, started their own businesses, are teaching and conducting research, and are in leadership roles in government, the private and nonprofit sectors. Around 2018, 19 or so, I applied for a Fulbright Senior Scholarship because again, you know, I'm always looking. And uh, my husband at the same time uh, got very sick uh, from cancer, passed away. It was a very aggressive cancer and he passed away within nine months. And I had received this this uh, fellowship and we had uh, planned as a family to go uh, to Zimbabwe. But when he passed, I realized, you know, I couldn't give up on the fellowship and that he would most likely be upset if I had. And so I packed myself and my son and we went to Zimbabwe. 
that experience was really amazing because I've always wanted to work in Africa. Um, you know, as a child, you know, you 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 heard all kinds of things uh, about the dark continent, what have you. But I knew that 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 was my that's where my roots were, and I always wanted to go back there. So working at the University of Zimbabwe was um, truly uh, uh, an, a wonderful experience. It, it also gave me and my son um, an, an opportunity to grieve, but not be so immersed in grief. And to be honest, like he went to uh, an international school and he had more of a, a social life than I did. He played basketball and because, you know, he took after his father. He was tall and he was like a, um, a, a basketball champ, you know, because nobody over there played U.S. basketball. So he was on the team. So he was a hero. And this international school, you know, there were kids from all over the world there. And um, I remember this this uh, this little girl, uh, I, I think she was uh, from Sweden or somewhere, but very cute, um, invited my son to a party. And I said, uh, and, you know, and she told me that I was going to take them to the party. And I said, well, excuse me, baby. Uh, so I, I said, let me talk to your father. So he, her, her father knew nothing about this and actually, you know, apologized. But uh, from that experience, we learned that kids in these international settings, they grow up very fast. And, um, and this young lady happened to be someone who latched on to every new kid that was a handsome guy. So uh, I had to definitely keep my eye out on her. But uh, the experience teaching at the university uh, was very interesting because I taught uh, students that were teachers in secondary schools. And part of the credentialing in Zimbabwe was that to get full credentials as a teacher, they had to come back and spend two years at university. So my students were highly motivated because they got full credentials, but they also got higher pay. So I, you know, that experience was very different from the experience that I had had back in the States teaching. Also, while I was in Zimbabwe, that was the height of inflation, you know, just going up, up, and up. And so food was very expensive. Uh, living, the, living was very fragile. You know, there was lots of death due to AIDS, for one thing. Uh, everybody worked extra jobs, even the professors in my department, because they never knew if they were really going to get their paycheck on time. So the professors, if they if they had pear trees or they grew maize on their plots of land, they would bring that to campus and sell outside uh, in and everything would be in the, the truck of their cars. I even went with one of the professors to his land to pick maize. And um, I thought I was going to get the maize free, but I still had to pay for it after I got all these little stickers and everything on me uh, going through the, the, the field. But I gladly did it because it was just, you know, it was fulfilling a need. But even with that, the people were very generous and charitable. So when we had tea time, which is something I never, you know, we have, we have break time here, but there tea time meant that everybody in the department came together. 
You bet not dare ask the secretary to do any work during that time because they participated in tea time. Somebody brought biscuits. They didn't sit to the side and eat those biscuits alone. They would take the biscuits and cut them up so that everybody got a piece. And I, I just, you know, I was just floored by that because I'd never experienced that before. It also was a time of um, a little turmoil. Like I rented a car so that I could get my son back and forth to school. His school was the jumping off point if something happened. So we knew that we had to go to the school because it had a big enough uh, uh, campus where a helicopter could land and take us away if need be. And then, you know how they say, you know, the eyes of a child, like we lived off campus on in this apartment complex. And my son, when we, we would come home, one, one evening he said, uh, mom, and you know, they had guards at the gate. And one day he said, mom, do you realize that they have a different guard every night at, at the gate? And you know, me with my knucklehead self, I, I wasn't even noticing. <laughs> and so I started paying attention and because, especially paying attention because that same guard would sit in our little patio area because we had a, 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 an apartment that was in the front of the complex and he would sit there at night and, and guard the place. So I started paying attention to that and, and offering the guard tea and also just making sure that I became more aware of my surroundings because during the time we were there, they, they were very low on gasoline. We had to go places, all kinds of places to get gasoline. One time, uh, the guard locked up the gates to our apartment complex because something had happened at the campus uh, and people were running from the campus wanting to get in. One time I drove on the campus and everybody was coming in going in the opposite direction. And some of my students saw me and said, prof, turn around, go back, turn around, go back. I didn't ask any questions. I turned that car around and left. So uh, the experience I, the experiences I had were nutrition oriented, but they were also very much life oriented. I came back to the States the day before 9-11 and which was you know a kind of a good thing because I might not have been able to get back I had sent my son uh back earlier so that he could start school on time uh so that was a very life-changing event I continued to work at ARS <clears throat> I also collaborated with USAID to help Nigeria improve the design and conduct of their national food survey. And later I worked with USAID to uh, help write their collaborative research program for nutrition RFP. And I detailed with them to help manage the program's nutrition research portfolio in Uganda, and Nepal. I might have stayed at USDA, USAID, because it, it was very exciting work, but they they really worked you too hard. You know, like you could be out in the field all day and then come back to your hotel. And then they wanted to have conference calls from the US into the morning, you know, so I was like, you know, maybe if I was 20 years younger, I could do this, but no, let me go back to, <laughs> let me go back to ARS. So my years at ARS, like I said, um, were very interesting. When I came back 
from the USAID detail, I became part of the senior executive service and I directed the Bellsville Agricultural Research Center, which at the time was the largest research center in the agency. Very stressful job because we were like in the eye of the storm being right outside of the beltway um, in DC. From there, I went to the Southeast area as an associate area director in Stoneville, Mississippi. That's how I ended up in Mississippi. Through both positions, I directed research in animal sciences, plant sciences, and natural resources. And I like to think that I helped bring some sensibility to discussions around those programs because I always looked at them through the lens of human nutrition. And I say that because there, there would be times that folks would be talking about animal science or plant sciences, like the like the cows ate themselves and the plants ate themselves. Like, the, you know, the human factor was not even part of the mix. So I like to think that I brought that piece. And sometimes it was um, uh, received well, and other times it wasn't necessarily so. But after five years in Mississippi, I retired in 2021. My years at ARS provided me the opportunity to view food, nutrition, and agriculture through a very deep and broad lens of experiences. Those experiences have led me to now serve as the Executive Director for Food First and carry on the organization's mission of ending the injustices that cause hunger and support food justice and food sovereignty work. Taking, uh, food First has gone through a transition and we're taking an assets-based versus a deficit-based approach. And by that, I mean, going back to that missionary complex, uh, the missionary approach views the organization as saving those poor communities and people. Whereas an assets-based approach understands that every community brings strengths and wisdom to the table, even with many daunting challenges. The organization looks at ways to work with the communities to build upon what they have and value. Therefore, uh, we're building off of the strengths that the Food First legacy provides, but we're especially listening to established and new voices to best move forward and aim, most importantly, to add to platforms where BIPOC voices can be amplified. And we are trying to do that in various ways. We are a virtual organization now where we had been based in Oakland for 47 plus years or so. And we've done begun to do things like reconstitute our fellowship program to focus on merging uh, next generation leaders in the field. And our first cohort of three fellows started in September of last year and will complete the program uh, August of this year. And we're just, you know, we're, we're starting almost anew and trying to uh, just develop uh, programs and projects that uh, really lend support towards BIPOC efforts in food justice and food uh, sovereignty. So with that, I just want to close with another reading. And this one 
is by, it's called Rice and it's by Gail Patricia Myers. In my house growing up, we ate rice every day. This is our dish. In spite of how our dish was made, we have not shame to feel. We make this dish in joy from trials and tribulations from all those years, feeling the mirages of six million lights. Songs that keep us free in spite of the talk of liberation. The rice people first, they knew the water and the rain and fished every day along coastal shores. In my house, we ate rice every day. We also fished and I learned nearly early how to fish along water's edge on a backwater creek with snakes crawling, minding their own business with my wooden reed fishing pole with my aunties and uncles. Fish and ate rice as a testimony to our knowing. It was the dish we made knowing rice and rain. Rice tasting like survival, fish comforting like water. We bleed our ancestors' blood. We give to spirit what is theirs. We keep what we can eat and know what to leave in the fields. We are rice people first. We see beauty in the wind. We taste truth in the rain. For this dish we made to remember the six million souls beneath the sea. We are rice. I too feel the spirit of those six million souls and others lost. I stand on their shoulders. My worldview says that depending on our ancestral lineage, we are the rice, the corn, the beans, the special crop that feeds the world. It's all up to you how far you grow your careers to nurture and contribute to the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, and share the, your, your experience in nutrition and also importantly, the life experience throughout the, the whole journey. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Uh, any questions from our audience? Gentile, I think Urban has a okay, Go ahead. Well, I usually like to uh, have our students uh, have first crack at the questions, but um, as long as I'm on camera, um, uh, some of you who were on earlier uh, will know that uh, Ellen Harris and I uh, uh, have a long history in. Um, positions in human nutrition uh, and policy. Um, and that uh, causes me to um, ask uh, the, the question uh, of Dr. Harris, uh, who has had uh, so much, uh, so rich and deep uh, career uh, in, in human nutrition and policy that uh, the following question. So uh, Ellen, uh, you've, you've been, uh, you've worked in Congress, you've worked in the, the USDA and ARS, you've worked with USAID. Um, if you had the power to do so, uh, how would you settle the issue which I think you and I and others uh, uh, struggled with uh, over the years about what should be the lead agency in, uh, in the US uh, of human nutrition? Should it be uh, the USDA? Should it be health and human services? Should we have uh, a much stronger presence, uh, let's say at NIH? Uh, with your rich experience, uh, would you who would you crown the queen of that uh, of that enterprise? Well, you would ask me that question, Irv. <laughs> <laughs> I personally do not believe in one organization 
being the lead. Uh, field uh, from a different perspective than USDA. I think that the strength that USDA brings to the field is that that community piece, you know, like kind of boots on the ground uh, where, you know, people are growing food, uh, they're consuming food, uh, there, you know, there's there's research in the lab, but there's research out there in the field per se, and not through a clinical lens, for example. Um, and I, I know there's been talk about creating this one big organization, but you know, I think that's a Western view, and that's one of the things that. Um, you know, when I, you know, when I talk about the missionary complex, that's, you know, that's what white people always want to do. Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be over <laughs> everything, you know? And, and I just, I, I just don't see the world like that, you know? Now, certainly there are a multitude of sins in USDA. They don't call it the last plantation for nothing. And there are lots of things that could be improved, but I think that uh, the, the perspectives from that department are very different from the ones that come from NIH. And uh, I think both of them have value. Thank you. We, we have time for another uh, one questions, anyone? Okay, so Alan, <laughs> another Alan, yeah. go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much for this presentation. My question actually focuses on your current place of employment, which is Institute for Food and Development Policy, Food First. And I'm really cu curious about the significance of Francis Moore LePay, Diet for Small Planet, Food First, and its authors and institutions and politics on your professional life. I mean, can you share with us any earlier associations you had with Diet for a Small Planet, the book, the efforts, Food First as sort of the, the heart of, a, of an evolving social movement. And I'm also curious along those lines, whether Food First was talked about in all your various institutional places. I mean, did they talk about it at the Select Committee uh, on Hunger or the Congressional Black Caucus or then in USDA or in your USAID placements or in your Fulbright contexts, because this was very influential from the 1970s on for a number of us who are more or less of your same age um, or the, have shared the same numbers of sons. So uh, I, I'm really curious about that and also whether your professional expertise as a public health nutritionist and your personal identity as an African-American um, how that's built on the foundations where Food First over the last 20 years or so really has had more, much more of a Mexican, Mexican-American, and Cuban focus. Well, that's a lot, Ellen. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, you know, in my home library, I have Diet for a Small Planet. And, um, and while I can't recall any specific uh, rec uh, uh, speaking on the work of Food First throughout my career, I think that because of my background and my, my, my social identity, my politic, uh, the work that nonprofits do in the food space, uh, has always been part of how I projected myself and and the work that I've done. Um, and of course, uh, when I say that Food First is going through a transition, uh, we most definitely uh, are trying to build upon the legacy of the organization but the board 
is seeking to have a more BIPOC-led and BIPOC-focused um, identity. And so with that, mean, with that it means um, you know, creating more opportunities for people of color. And I say that kind of lightly because I was in a talk once where a Native American sister said, you know, what's with this people of color stuff? You know, uh, there's no such thing. You know, what tribe do you belong to? And I respect that, you know, but it's almost like, you know, we're because we don't, we aren't in charge. There, you know, there has to be some kind of name, you know, black folks were called color, they were called Negro, they were called Afro American. Now, you know, some people say black, some people say African American. So, you know, that's all part of being uh, in this United States of America. And so food first is just, you know, wanting to make a co contribution to the areas of food justice and food sovereignty and, but do it through a lens of uh, people of color. Great. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harris, uh, again, uh, for, for the very nice uh, sharing your experience with us. And uh, uh, because of time, we have to end here. Like, uh, And thank you so much for everyone attending the, the seminar and hopefully you can attend again for next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.